So this is the first brief paper overview I'm doing. So this is a broad overview, sort of the cruising altitude overview of this paper that somebody um, had posted on the Facebook page. It just so happened they caught me at a time I was going to read a paper and it looked interesting, so I read it and uh, threw these slides together. So the paper is Simultaneous Control of Error Rates in FMRI Data Analysis by King, Bloom, uh, Ombao, and Badre. So this is a neuroimage paper. Here's the info. Um, the first two authors are from Vanderbilt's Biostats Department. Oh, so, yep. Uh, then we have somebody from Irvine Stats Department and then somebody from Linguistics at Brown. So yeah, quite a few statisticians here. The second author, as far as I can tell, this is the person who is who does a lot of research on the method, the primary method that's used here. So I'm just going to guess, and I could be wrong, but I'm wondering if the first author is their student. Anyway, that's that. So here's an overview of the abstract. So the idea here, so typically in our studies, we have type 2 and type 1 errors. Not typically, but always. We have type 1 and type 2 errors. But typically, we have a type 1 error rate that's 0.05. This is the thing we obsess about the most because we have a multiple comparison problem, and we're going to cover that in the course eventually. Um, but we all know that we want to increase our sample size because that helps our power. In other words, it reduces the type 2 error, which is 1 minus the power. But they're like, hey, well, that's not fair. It seems like as we increase our sample size, not only should our power benefit, but our type 1 errors should also benefit. So let's reduce both. But there's no free lunch. Um, note, this has to, you have to increase the sample size. In this paper, it's a single subject analysis. So sample size is the length of your fMRI run. Right, and this is an fMRI-based paper. So how do they do this? They use something called the likelihood paradigm. So when I first saw this, I'm like, what? They use likelihood ratio tests? No, it's, it's related but different. And um, I'll try to explain that again. It's a broad overview, but just to get your footing. So the likelihood paradigm uses three pieces of information. The strength of the evidence, which is the likelihood ratio. The probability of the design generating misleading evidence and the probability of data generating misleading evidence. And I'll explain all of those. So the general framework, again, this is single subject data. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe perhaps this could have clinical use. Perhaps they're going to expand this to group studies. It is a block design. So, you know, it's, you always have to start somewhere, right? And they focus on increasing the length of the run. That's how their n, or sample size, is increased. The competing methods are random field theory. So this is uh, basic FSL analysis. Uh, you choose the two thresholds. SPM, I'm no longer positive it's using random field theory. It might be using a false discovery rate version, but not the one that's used in this paper. They're using a voxel-wise FDR approach here. Uh, importantly, random field theory and false discovery rate are controlling different types of errors. So random field theory might look like it's really conservative. It's just because of the type of error rate it's controlling. And they look at Bayes factor. And last but not least, their method, the star of the show, is this likelihood paradigm. So uh, of these, the first two are frequentist type approaches. In other words, they're related to p-values. Bayes factor works with, it actually works with the likelihood. So both of these can th be thought of as things that work with the likelihood. So how do they differ from this? So now these are Bloom's words. So these are, he has a chapter, it's kind of an introduction to this approach, and I'll put a link to it. It's a Google Books thing so um, that I found. Hopefully the link will work to a book chapter that seems to be mostly uh, there. And, you know, Google Books sometimes cuts out pages, but... Here's what he said. Frequentist approach asks the question, or answers the question, what should I do? Bayesian says, what should I believe? And he says the likelihood par paradigm answers the question, what do the data say? So both of these approaches use the likelihood. You can, you, you can run a likelihood ratio test and get a p-value. Likewise, the likelihood, likelihood is used in the Bayesian analysis, and I will show that shortly. So they both use it, but it's not the main endpoint. Um, what else? He also said something else, right? He said frequentists and Bayesian approaches go beyond the data. 
um, uh, frequentists supply additional information about the sample space from which our data were drawn, and Bayesian approaches incorporate prior information. Um, I think he's saying that his approach, the likelihood paradigm, focuses more on just what the data have to say. But anyway, all Bloom's words, not mine. I'm just, just uh, telling you what he said. And again, that link will be below. So just a quick uh, base factor overview. Here's good old Bayes rule. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with this. So um, D stands for data, M is model. So the idea is you want to focus on the probability of the model given the data. Like, well, here are my data. How likely is my model? And this is equal to the probability of the data given the model. This is the likelihood. I'll get there in a second times the probability of the model divided by the probability of the data. This is the posterior distribution. This is the likelihood. Again, I said likelihood. It's used in basically all three of these approaches in different ways. This is the prior. So this is, you know, whenever I think of Bayesian results, people always criticize the prior choice. And then this is the evidence in the denominator. So here's Bayes' factor. Basically, it's a ratio of likelihoods. See? for two models, model one and model two. So you have two competing models. And the idea is this ratio of likelihoods, if it's one, both of your models are equally good. If model one is better, then this probability will be higher. And so your ratio will be greater than one. So <clears throat> ratio greater than one favors model one, ratio less than one favors model two. And this is how the likelihood those two likelihoods are estimated using these integrals. And I'm definitely not going to get into that. Now the likelihood ratio test is related to Bayes' factor. It's just the difference is instead of using these integrals over here, which, and by the way, these are, um, if ever you hear about uh, Bayesian statistics and how the Markov chain Monte Carlo is used, that's what it's doing. They actually, in their um, results in this paper, they use uh, the Laplacian approximation to avoid MCMC. Anyhow, enough of that. Back here, uh, this approach goes back to here and says, you know what, I'm just going to use the traditional likelihood. So if you've ever taken a statistics course, you've worked with that. So typically this is a normal distribution, but it doesn't have to be. This is the parameter you want to estimate. This is the value of the data for a single subject. And what you do is you multiply these probabilities together and that yields the likelihood. So this, um, if you've taken a, uh, maybe a, the first theoretical stats class in your series of statistics classes, that would be covered there. So this is familiar, I should say, probably to everybody. This is probably less familiar to everybody. So this is only one component of this likelihood paradigm of Bloom's. This is the other part of the other part, and it's this idea of evidence. So this is really interesting. So the idea is you have to choose a threshold K, and basically if you're above, uh, it's weird, he uses logs here and just one over K and K everywhere else. If you're above K or the log of K, that's strong evidence for the region supporting your alternative. If you're below, that supports the null. So you, the, he, this is used to determine you know, the null or the alternative make more sense. But then there's kind of a dead zone, a weak evidence region. And what's interesting is if things fall into this dead zone, you could think of this as kind of like a, a bad area, right? So by removing this, you're not polluting this strong evidence of the region supporting the null. Does that make sense? So I could just dump these values, this weak evidence region. I could say, you know what, I'm going to combine this weak evidence region with the strong evidence region supporting the null. That's kind of what frequentist approaches do, right? Because we only have one threshold in frequentist approaches, and below the threshold is null, above is alternative. So that's one difference with this model, but he addresses that, um, and I'll talk about that later. He does do a single uh, threshold apart. So, right, and again, notably falling in the weak uh, supports neither the null or the alternative hypothesis. And actually, I should use, um, instead of null and alternative, I should use HO and H1. Okay, so you still have to choose this K. 
And he points out, well, this isn't really a downside. Every method has to choose something. Um, they use different values throughout the paper. I'll let you read it to see. One that they use a lot is 1 over 20, since that yields 0.05, which is most close to the threshold we use in standard uh, frequentist approaches. But th they're not exactly equal. This 0.05 with the interpretation of k is not exactly the same as a p-value threshold. Okay, how their test works, we have two competing hypotheses. So this is actually a lot different. Normally our second, our alternative hypothesis is a range of values and this is a specific value. So that is something very different here and that's going to make it harder to implement. So it takes into account these three evidential quantities. The first is the strength of the evidence, which is simply the likelihood ratio, our old friend, which we've known about for a while um, from before. Then it has two other things, the propensity for a study to yield misleading evidence. So this is the probability of observing misleading evidence. And these are conditional probabilities, much like in our frequentist approach. We assume the null is true and we say, well, what's the probability that our likelihood ratio is above our threshold K? But then we also, and this is most closely related to the alpha from a frequentist approach. And this is most closely related to a type two error rate, which is often called beta. And this is assuming the alternative is true. What's the probability that we're in that range to the lower left-hand side that supports the null? And then we have the propensity for the observed results to be misleading, which is the probability that the observed evidence is misleading. So it's these two conditional probabilities, kind of flipping things around. Probably the, the, assuming the likelihood ratio is greater than K, the probability of the null, and then the flip side for less than one over K, probability alternative. I feel like he doesn't discuss this much in the paper. So why is their test different? Um, again, instead of fixing one type, one error rate and maximizing the others, this approach just as is, it's not that you have to do something special when you're using this approach, but just the way it works is it's minimizing the average of the error rate. So uh, just by design, it's going to minimize both the type one and type two errors simultaneously. That is also glossed over, and I'm sure it is in the tutorial that I linked to in the info box. Anyway, so that's the big difference here. The type one error is gonna move with sample size in an expected way. <laughs> okay. I'm going to show the error rate comparisons. This is kind of a cartoon example. He looks at a single voxel and then four voxels because this is framed around multiple comparison correction. And remember this uh, number line we have here where we have these three evident evidence uh, categories, strong evidence for the null, weak evidence, strong evidence for the alternative. So as I said earlier, it's kind of maybe you could think, well, it's not fair because frequentists have to dump this region in with this region. So he devised a second method, this DLP1, which just means it's a um, dichotomized version with a single threshold. So it most closely uh, represents a standard frequentist approach. So we have DLP1 and then just LP. All right, with one voxel, we're looking at the type one error rate. Obviously it's 0.05 for Bonferroni. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit different for these other two approaches because they're just different beasts. So the likelihood, it looks like it's a little conservative. The, it's 0.01. And for DLP1, it's a little high, it's 0.078. But when you look at the type two error rate, so one minus these values is your power. So this only has, what, 73% power or so. 72% power. Not good. Whereas the likelihood method in the DLP, the dichotomized uh, uh, version, have uh, really low type 2 error rates. And by design, of course, the type 2 error rates will always equal the type 1 error rates. So that's just how this method works. So what happens when we introduce a multiple comparison problem? Just ramping it up to four voxels using a Bonferroni correction. The voxels are independent, so this is controlled perfectly at 0.05, the likelihood is 0.06, the dichotomized version is 0.28, so it's a little elevated. But again, when you look at the type two error rates, you can see that um, there's still a benefit. 
So the the type 2 error rates are super high now with Monferroni, which we know it's really conservative, so that's not a surprise. And likelihood and the dichotomized likelihood um, are better. The likelihood's much better, and the dichotomized likelihood is a little bit worse, and that's because that middle region has been uh, combined with the evidence for the null. But you can see that, so just to recap, the DLP1 was devised to be most comparable to Bonferroni, but you can see there's still a benefit. Here is a result from their simulation study. The truth is on the far left. Um, so then they just simulated block design data. Again, this is single subject. It was only for a single slice of data. I'm always a little nervous when I see that, but it looks like in their real data analysis, they did whole brain. So why do I get nervous when I see that? Well, sometimes it means something only works in two dimensions. Uh, sometimes it means that the method is so computationally intensive that it would take forever to analyze all slices of the brain. I, I don't think that's the case here. Okay, so here's the truth. Here's random field theory. Uh, this is not a surprise. Random field theory is generally conservative. It's controlling a different error rate than FDR. So it's not that random field theory isn't doing its job. Um, and FDR is doing it better. They're controlling different error rates. So nothing's wrong, nothing's right. Uh, we do have this big false positive blob that shows up both for FDR and for the Bayes factor approach. And again, let's see, the FDR approach that was used, I said that was a voxel wise. The Bayes factor, as I said earlier, they used a Laplacian approximation to MCMC. Uh, I think that's all I have written down. I don't know the other details of it. And then they use their dichotomize version um, here. So, of course, it looks beautiful. Why else would you put it in your paper advertising that result? But still, it's impressive. Okay, so now this is, I think, one of the first figures. I should have put the figure number in the results. And I'm not going to go over all the results because this is just a broad overview, but of course, let's look at these type one error rates and type two error rates and see what happens. So this is just focusing on the type one error rate and uh, the x-axis is the length of the time series because remember, that's the benefit of this method as we increase our n, which in this case is the length of the time series, we should see both of our error rates drop together. And also remember for the DLP-LP methods, the error rates, the type 1 and type 2 error rates, will always be the same. Um, since this is uh, the DLP and LP methods will have the same type 1 error rate here because of where that threshold was, but the type 2 error rates will be different. So they're a single line here. Um, random field theory is in red, base factor, blue, and green is FDR. And again, you might be like, oh my gosh, FDR, it's doing so poorly. It's controlling a different type of error rate. Um, so in terms of what FDR is supposed to do, it's probably doing that exactly right. Um, it's not controlling necessarily the error rate that's shown here. Um, I'll try to find a good reference for that. I know somebody who's written something that has that really clearly, but it might only be in her dissertation. Anyway. Uh, one notable thing is that the error rates appear, or well, they are increasing for random field theory, FDR, and Bayes factor. And that's because they're very conservative when there isn't a lot of data. Um, that's what's happening there. But of course, the star of the show, the error rate decreases as we expect. So here are the type 2 error rates, and thankfully, as we would expect as sample size increases, the type 2 error rates drop for everybody. But of course, they're the lowest for um, the LP method. That's using the three, the three regions. The dichotomized version, which has two regions, will be a little bit higher. That's expected, but it's still pretty good. And then we have FDR. Um, and since FDR is uh, less conservative, you, you, the power tends to be better. Anyway, and then random field theory. Okay, so that's just a comparison of the results. I'll leave it to you to read the paper for more details. And there are two more panels here that I'm not showing. One's just the average of the error rates, and then one has to do with how many um, voxels fall into that middle region. So here's the real data analysis. Um, 
boy, I forget the task, but I'll tell you the, the general idea. Sorry, I'm a statistician, so the, the tasks don't always stick in my head. They were viewing objects and they were told to focus on one or two qualities of the object, texture and something else, and make a judgment. Um, the images were shown for two seconds. I forget how many images were shown in a row, but they were blocked. So they would have a bunch in a block where you're supposed to focus on texture and a bunch more. And the reason they use this is because it's a well-known task and they fully expect bilateral activation. Um, so yeah, you always work with a task that you know, where you know what the activation should look like when you're assessing a method. So what we have here is on the left standard analysis in FSL using random field theory correction. Um, did they smooth the data? Do they say if they smooth the data? Yes. So say it wouldn't be fair if they didn't smooth the data because random field theory does not work if you don't smooth your data. So they smoothed the data for random field theory, but their method, and I didn't really have time to go into this, you don't need to spatially smooth the data. Instead, it, uh, when estimating the likelihood, it collects information from neighboring voxels, so the smoothing's inherent in that way. Anyhow, point here is, and this is the DLP method again, uh, with a K of 20, which again kind of mirrors this 0.05, you do get the bilateral activation that they expected. So, and again, it's not, the data aren't spatially smooth, but I'm almost positive that in this example, the likelihood they used is estimated by collecting data over neighboring voxels. Okay, obviously I can't go over all the results. There were different smoothing methods that were compared different values for the alternative. Remember, that's kind of a weird thing here. Gone are the days of saying C beta is greater than zero. You have to have a specific value. And it's not quite a contrast. Well, no, it was a contrast in this paper. Um, they also looked at non-Gaussian data, meaning the residuals, instead of being Gaussian, were drawn from a chi-square distribution. And they compared the choice of K just to show, well, how much do these results wiggle around if we change this K? We have to make this choice. So those are important considerations. So again, both error rates will decrease as sample size, length of time series increases. These are their main points in the comments section. And they do acknowledge that a downside of this requires choosing a specific alternative. Um, apparently they don't view the choice of K as a big downside. Um, but yeah, so that's all I have. Let me know what you think about this type of, I don't know, uh, video. They're going to go a little longer than the other ones, but I'll do my best. Ask questions, comment. If you know more about these things and you want to pipe up about it, um, go ahead and do it and have a great day.